I made a transparent case cover for my computer down here in the shop. Now this PC, I've had it for about, I want to say five years or so. It pooped out on me a while back. It was a production computer, a gateway, and pretty much all the gateway parts in it went bad. The motherboard, the graphics card, the power supply, even the hard drive. That was a Seagate though. I think it had something to do with the power supply. Um, not quite sure though. Everything except, knock on wood, the CPU, but that's an Intel, so I'm hoping, keeping my fingers crossed, that it doesn't finally poop out on me. So I pretty much replaced everything in it. It's no longer a gateway. It's just a Frankenstein computer that I threw together. Um, I just used the original tower that I had for my gateway. So I figured now I got all this cool stuff in there. You know, I got a badass power supply, motherboard, graphics card. I'm running uh, 12 gigs of RAM, I got this RAM fan, bunch of LEDs, bunch of cool stuff that you like to look at, but you can't see it with the case cover on there. So, you know, you can buy transparent case covers, you can even buy transparent uh, computer towers. Um, but I figured I didn't want to spend the money, and I'm pretty handy, you know, I got a lot of skills. I could just build one out of uh, acrylic, plexiglass. So I did that, and we're going to go through the whole process, and it's it's pretty beastly. I'm pretty happy with it. Now, I wanted to keep this on the cheap end because, you know, my reasoning for doing this was that I didn't want to spend the money on a professional one. So, I used basic tools. You know, most of these you probably have laying around your house. I just, I had the people at the hardware store cut out the plexiglass for me to the dimensions that I wanted. Now, it's pretty easy to cut if you have just a simple scoring tool um, for acrylic. But sometimes it's hard to get a clean cut and you don't want to go through multiple sheets of plexiglass until you get that nice finished cut that you want. Um, so some things that I've learned before we get into this, in case you want to do this at home, uh, this is really easy. It took me, you know, a day. Not even that. It took me like half a day to do. Um, I was using a pretty cheap drill. This is just my around the house, you know, fix it up project drill. Uh, a drill press would be ideal, but since I wanted to keep it on the cheap end, I went with a cheaper tool. Or if you have a drill with a faster, you know, can spin at a higher RPM than my drill can, because plexiglass, uh, it tends to chip and crack. Um, so if you have a drill with a high RPM, a drill press would be ideal, but, you know, whatever you have will do the job, but this is not going to be professional quality. So, you know, if you want a professional quality, you might as well just go buy one. Um, acrylic does not like to be tapped. I tried securing the tabs to hold the panel in place with some screws, and there were some self-tap screws. So I pre-drilled the holes, and then I tried to uh, screw these screws into there, and they just sheared right off. They didn't want to go in there. They just broke. Um, so if you're going to be mounting something to plexiglass with screws you probably want to go with bolts just dr drill a clean through and through hole and use nuts and bolts to mount it because plexiglass is kind of hard to tap it'd be like trying to tap glass um, not fun I can't imagine that turning out very well so also I discovered plexiglass makes any project look more awesome so stick with me and we're gonna run through it Oh, and by the way, I use JB Weld eventually instead of the screws. Um, JB Weld is a pretty awesome compound. It comes in two separate tubes. You've got an epoxy and an activator. You mix them together in equal proportions, and then you just spread it onto your working surface, whatever you're doing. Um, has, you know, about a 24-hour cure time for it to harden completely before you can actually use it in your application, but... Um, it's pretty awesome. It bonds pretty much anything to anything else. Uh, they also make some high heat versions of it for, you know, if you're doing something with 
engine components or something that gets really hot. I've never used it in engine work. I'm kind of scared to. Uh, I don't think I ever will. But in case you need something for a high heat application, JB Weld, check it out. It's good stuff. And we're going to get to work. This is my micro drill index. Got my power drill here, my dial caliper, my screws that I'm going to use. These sheet metal shears, we really don't need these anymore because I already cut out the tabs. Um, and the JB Weld, I was talking about my screwdriver so we're gonna get to work all right so the first thing I've done is I've taken this one tab off of my case tower and I've secured it using some clamps to a piece of scrap wood so that I have something to drill into as I'm drilling my holes and I'm gonna drill six holes in this one um, and I've, I'm using a drill bit here for this you want to make sure that the entire screw can fit into it but it's not so large that uh, the head of it falls through it also. So I've, I've gauged up this drill bit using my dial caliper here to be slightly larger than the full diameter of the, uh, the screw. So now we're gonna drill some holes. All right, so I've drilled the holes on the one panel and as you can see, the screw fits nicely in there and it's not so large that the head of the screw falls through. Um, I tried to space these out somewhat evenly. We don't need it to be perfect though because this part of it isn't going to be seen once it's all finished. So you just want them to be spaced out evenly so that you get a nice grip, you know, a nice secure fix to the plexiglass somewhat evenly. So that's it. Now we're going to do the same thing to the other side. Alright, so now I've got my holes drilled in the tabs and I've secured it. I've lined it up with the plexiglass and I'm going to use these holes I already drilled in the tabs as a drill guide for my holes that I drill through the plexiglass. Um, and I've gauged up this drill bit here to be slightly less than the total diameter of the screw that I'm putting in there so that the threads have something to grip onto. So now I'm going to drill each one of these holes on either side and then I'm going to mix up my JB Weld, I'm going to apply it on there and then I'm going to secure it with the screws so that along with the screws and the adhesive it should be a pretty firm fit it should be a, a really good bond that I have on there and then we can start drilling the vent holes so we'll be back. Well I had a little frag though so I had to shift fire um, take a different approach so it turns out that my screws when I tried to drill them in they were just shearing right off so you can see that there so this plexiglass was a little bit too tough for my screws so instead, I've just decided to go straight with the JB Weld. You can see I've mixed it up there. It comes in a, one of the tubes is a black, kind of gummy liquid almost type thing, and the other one is white. So you mix them up and they make this gray color. And then you just apply it onto your working surface. So I roughed up the edges of the tabs and the plexiglass. Um, and then I applied that JB Weld on there. So now I've got them sitting in these clamps and it says the, the dry time, or the set time rather, is 20 to 25 minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave it in these clamps for a full hour. And the cure time is 24 hours. So to fully cure and harden, needs about 24 hours. Um, so before I start filling with this and trying to drill my vent holes, I'm gonna let it sit here for about an hour. So now we just wait. All right, so we're back here this wonderful November day. I decided to go ahead and let this sit overnight just to make sure that it was hardened because I didn't want to take the clamps off and have it fall apart on me and have to start the process all over again. So we've got a really strong bond on here. You see I've got, I use JB Weld, and this is on there. It's basically part of, you know, it's all like one singular piece now. Um, so I don't need those screws. They were just going to be overkill anyway. And all this ugliness here is going to be covered up later once we finish it. So you can see I've left this protective film on here. And on the back I've left as much as I could because I don't want to remove that until um, I'm done messing around with stuff because I don't want to scratch the plexiglass. You know, that would be just a little eyesore in the beautiful work of art we're doing today. So I've drawn up this little template on a piece of notebook paper. And this is going to be my pattern for when I drill the vent holes. So now what I have to do is I have to put this on the computer tower and try and find the center point. And if I find the center point, I can tape this on and use it as a guide. 
So we're gonna do that right now. Alright, so now I've got the center point of my template here lined up with the center point of the CPU cooling fan that we marked earlier. And I've got it squared up with the edge here, and I've secured it with a couple pieces of tape. Now the idea is I don't want to start drilling into this paper onto a smooth surface because typically when you do that the bit wants to slide around on you. So we'll be off alignment if we do it that way. So what I'm going to do is take an awl here and I'm going to punch some holes, some very small holes. They're obviously not going to go all the way through. They're just going to be little markers um, for our bit to grab onto once we do start drilling. And then I'm going to start the drills using this manual um, little tool here. I don't know what it's called, but it'll start a drill hole for you. And then we're going to actually drill the holes. So all that work is quite tedious, so let's speed it up a little bit with the magic of video editing. in here everything looks pretty good I'm happy with it see that nice uh, vent pattern I got there so I put some duct tape some black gorilla duct tape around here not very classy but you know this was supposed to be on the cheap so it's good to go has a nice firm fit and I'm happy with it so that's it Alright, so I really wanted to finish this episode and publish it because I was really excited about it. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. But the beer review is sort of an issue because the only beer I have here is Schlafly Hefeweizen and Rolling Rock. And I already did a review on Schlafly Hefeweizen, so I can't redo that, you know. So, Rolling Rock, it's pretty cheap. You know, I call these gas station beers because they're just 
you know, beer like Coors or Natty or Budweiser or something like that. You know, you just drink it's something to I drink it like soda. It's not something I really appreciate. I just kinda suck it down, I sip it as I'm doing whatever, but I mean Rolling Rocket's a pretty good beer. And I like to drink it from these 16 ounce cans. So I'm I'm uh, deviating from my established convention where anytime I want to really appreciate a beer, I pour it into clean glassware and drink it from there. In this case, I drink Rolling Rock from a can because it's just that kind of beer. It's a St. Louis Brewing Company, Latrobe Brewing Company. Um, and it's pretty good, you know, I'd compare it to Pabst or something similar, you know, it's just a good, it's a sipping beer, it's like a, a long, a long-term beer, I guess, you know, those, those more flavorful, high-gravity beers, you drink those, you sip them, because you really want to appreciate the flavor of them. Rolling Rock is one of those, you know, all-day drinking beers, like you can drink it for breakfast, you can drink it for lunch, dinner, and your midnight snack. So, instead of popping a top, we're gonna crack one open. Alright, so it's pretty smooth, it's not very foamy, it's pretty watery looking. You're going for the smell, and it's got that nice, you know, typical lager smell, that light, you know, production beer aroma to it. Similar to Budweiser or Coors or Natty or Michelob or you know any mass production lager you might find out there. Something you drink at parties or uh, baseball games or whatever you do. I don't know. Wherever you drink. I drink all the time. So, Except at work. I don't drink at work. Probably wouldn't have a job if I did. So, you know, it's got that nice, that nice lint or uh, light aroma to it. Not, not too strong. It smells like bread, pretty much. Nice fresh loaf of bread. This is interesting, I've never thoroughly analyzed the flavor of Rolling Rock. I'm trying to think what to compare it to. It's got sort of a fruity flavor, like if you were to make a sandwich out of bananas, apples, and uh, tangerines maybe. You know, it's not bitter. It's a very smooth beer. You can, you can throw these down pretty easy. Um, which can be dangerous at times, because, you know, it, it goes down like water. It's so smooth. And it's very inexpensive, you know, it's cheaper than Pabst. I like Pabst, I drink Pabst a lot, but Rolling Rock is, a, I don't want to say a lot less expensive, it's slightly less expensive than Pabst. Um, but it's good, it's got a nice, you know, a little bit of tanginess to it. Um, it's pretty similar to your typical lager beers, you know, those those party beers, the thing you bring a giant case of to a party or something, or a, a wedding, or a family reunion, or a barbecue, or whatever you do, you just sit around, everybody grabs one out of the cooler, just throw back a few. I like it. It's good shit, man. You should check it out. I don't even know how far they go, how, uh, how broad their distribution range is. Um, I know you find it pretty much all over the place here in St. Louis. Not a lot of people really pay much attention to it, though. It's, you know, we've got Anheuser-Busch here in St. Louis, which is 
the big thing. Uh, personally, you know, they just once they sold out to InBev. I mean, I guess it was a good move on the owner's part, um, the shareholders, but you know, it's it's no longer American. Now it's a Belgian company that owns Anheuser Busch, and Anheuser Busch is one of the one of the landmarks of St. Louis. But, I mean, I guess they've still got most of their employees there, and they still make good money, and they still make good beer. I just, you know, I don't drink it so much anymore because I was a little bit pissed off when they sold out. But anyway, Rolling Rock, smaller brewing company. You know, I'm a huge fan of local breweries. Um, Rolling Rock, Schlafly is another one, Urban Chestnut. What else? Six Row Brewing Company. There's all sorts of them. There's tons of them. Uh, Kirkwood Station Brewing Company, that's another good one. I think I want to do some reviews on their beers in the future. Um, all sorts of them around St. Louis. Micro brews, small time brewing companies. So, Rolling Rock, it's one of my all time favorite, you know, laid back sipping beers. One of my endurance beers if I'm going to be drinking all night or something. I'll probably have quite a few Rolling Rocks. So, check it out. I don't know how far they go, if it's in your area or. If you ever stop by St. Louis, check out Rolling Rock. I like it. And as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.